Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Access Minnesota brings you the newsmakers and the stories that shape our everyday lives with analysis from University of Minnesota faculty experts. Now, here's Jim Dubois. Newspaper circulation in the U.S. has been in decline since 1987, but it's only in the last decade that newspapers and media companies have seen profits drastically decline. While newspapers and their readers move online, advertisers have been slow to follow and are less willing to spend large sums in the digital medium. The result has been massive layoffs at newspapers all across the country, and many newspaper companies have been forced to file for bankruptcy or even stop the presses altogether. This month on Access Minnesota, we talk with Joel Kramer, the co-founder and editor of MinPost, a local all-digital news site. We look at how MinPost is reformatting the traditional newspaper and how digital media can be economically viable. But first, Access speaks to University of Minnesota journalism professor Seth Lewis about the current state of journalism and what the news might look like in the future. Seth Lewis is an assistant professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Minnesota. Professor Lewis, welcome to Access Minnesota. Thanks, great to be here. Newspaper circulation is generally down, the Star Tribune being a happy exception here in the Twin Cities. But um, does that necessarily mean that fewer people are being exposed to the newspaper's content? Do we know how many people are now accessing the content online? Right, so newspapers like to tout, actually when they talk about their numbers, they, they like to combine both print and digital audiences to say that, hey, lo and behold, we're reaching more people than ever. Um, but the problem is that those, those print subscribers are worth dollars and the digital readers are worth dimes or maybe pennies. Um, and so the, the advertising system is broken. You know, newspapers have relied upon, for literally hundreds of years, this kind of advertising subsidy that has underwritten uh, all of the kinds of functions that newspapers deliver in terms of journalism. And now as the, the advertising stream starts to go away, simply because the retailers and car manufacturers, others that have been long time advertisers for newspapers are simply struggling themselves, spending less money on ads. And then online, those ads are simply worth less. They, 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 they just don't pay as much as they do in print. And so for newspapers, the challenge is how do you take what is increasingly a digital audience and actually making money with that that kind of group of people. And so some have looked to subscriptions and pay models and other things. Others have tried to kind of rethink their strategies altogether and say what aspects of what we do really delivers real value and can be monetized as valuable. It has been difficult for newspapers to attract online advertising, but is there any evidence that print ads are more effective, say, than an online ad? That, again, that's a great point. I mean, the, the, the old saw in advertising has been that, uh, you know, you don't quite know where, you know that half of your advertising is effective, but you're not sure which half. And so for, for many businesses, that is a constant challenge of assessing, all right, we are spending X amount on advertising. What is that actually delivering in terms of value to us as a company? And obviously, the internet provides all kinds of new opportunities for tracking what advertisements actually lead to in terms of consumer awareness or purchasing decisions. And you don't have that kind of thing in print. At the same time, I think also advertisers are recognizing that online ads, in many cases, because they're, they're just simply cluttered up by a lot of other ads, and that, that a lot of that people don't want to be associated with, if you look online, right, we've all seen what the kinds of ads are online, and they're you know, tummy tighteners and teeth whiteners, and, and a lot of times you know, the big corporations don't want to be associated with that. They want to be better positioned and more prominently placed in something like the newspaper, where it can be you know, packaged around more elite uh, types of nice content, and they can feel safer with that kind of thing. Plus, they can make more of a splash, as opposed to some little banner ad or some tiny little text ad. Are media companies really in those dire of straits financially? Are, are most of them still in the black, or are many, many more going into the red? So the, one of the biggest mistakes that many media companies made five, six, seven years ago was that just like a lot of us bought maybe too much house, more than we could afford, newspaper and media companies bought more than they could afford in terms of they took on way too much debt. And so as a result, they're trying to service these debt payments and so even while they remain somewhat profitable, they're really, really pinched because they're also handling all this debt. So it's, it's almost like it mirrors some of the crisis we face overall economically, financially in this country. So I think, are these institutions, these companies going to be with us in the near term? Definitely. In the long term, I, I think it is going to be an inter interesting proposition to see who survives and what kinds of new emerging companies and institutions come up to take some of the place to maybe provide news in different types of ways that we haven't imagined before. 
So I think that at this point, I think in the next few years, certainly I think the odds are good that many of them will still be around and making money. But you do have a lot of new players that are emerging and are beginning to change the, the nature of this marketplace. If you had to select the top three biggest changes in journalism that you've experienced, say, in the last 10 years, what would they be? Certainly, I think the biggest change has just been the loss of, of subsidy. The, the Baghdad Bureau, so to speak, was, was underwritten by Walmart, right? It was the advertising from these other companies that allowed news organizations to do very expensive kinds of reporting. So as, as advertising subsidy has, has just started to evaporate um, under our feet, in a way, journalists then have had to kind of really step back and say, well, you know, what is really worth it, right? What is really worth spending time and money on doing? Now, when I worked, I worked in newspapers for a while, and, and we never had to ask those kinds of questions. And I think that if I were to re-enter the news, newspaper today, clearly there'd have to be a bit more of a conversation about what is it we do, how does it provide value, and, and how do we kind of do good journalism without necessarily always just thinking of the bottom line necessarily, but really providing information that on its own is really useful and compelling and interesting. Um, I, I think that's been just that, that, that disruption in subsidy has been huge. The second big change, I would say, is just the, 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 the kind of Googleization of everything to where now search is the primary portal through which we experience much of information um, in daily life. And that is true for news as well. So news organizations have had to adjust to an environment where most people actually don't come to their homepage. They come through the back door through Google searches and other means, and other links, and so forth. So in this, you have this whole kind of ecosystem on Twitter and Facebook and Google of, of link sharing and of kind of uh, search engine optimizing kinds of approaches. And so news organizations, some of them like blogs and other major providers online, have like the Huffington Post, for instance, is very much in that realm of trying to draw in traffic through search techniques and through very clickable kinds of headlines. That's a big change for journalism, and I think is it, is it, is it kind of changes the way they think about what they write and, and then how people actually get that information. I'd say if I have to say one other big change would just be the role of the journalist relative to users in the process. Clearly in the past 10 years and even just in the past three or four, um, I would say with the rise of social media, you've seen a, a big shift in the kind of role that a journalist can have relative to audience members. Um, a good example of this and one that I've actually studied in my own research is uh, a fellow by the name of Andy Carvin at NPR. And he became famous during the Arab Spring in early 2011 for the kind of reporting that he did on the crises in, uh, in Egypt and Tunisia and elsewhere in the Middle East. What was unique about Andy Carvin is that he was in Washington, D.C. And all of his reporting was, in many cases, from his home or from his office there in D.C. And it was, he was using so Twitter especially, but social media, to curate and aggregate and filter um, reports from the ground, from activists, from protesters, from journalists, from others who were there reporting what they were seeing and doing. And from that, he was trying to give almost this kind of running stream of, of, of information about the events. And so that kind of role as the journalist as, as aggregator, the journalist as, in a way, kind of like a, a real-time broadcaster of this kind of live, flowing kind of information, that's a very big shift. And I think you are going to see, though, the rise of more curatorial types of journalism in the future. When Access Minnesota returns, Professor Seth Lewis tells us more about the changing expectations for journalists. Access Minnesota will return after these messages.